Pardon. Our this meeting yeah, so is gonna, being yeah, so we are going to go to our Zoom and begin. We're going to be also live on Zoom. We're also live on Zoom. Okay. So we should be there shortly. Thank the Lord. So welcome. Welcome to all our friends. All our friends. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. Amen. And we trust everyone had a good day. We trust you had a great week. All right. Yes, that echo is from Facebook. All right. So, so this is the day the Lord has made. And I trust that your heart is open to go where you've not gone before. Uh, these are more than bless me meetings. This is change me meeting. This is about reformation, it's about change of our hearts. Your relationship with God depends <clears throat> on your understanding of God. Whatever we build in the earth, whether you build a home, you build a business, you build a church, you build a family, it is all predicated on your understanding of God. Whatever we understand of God affects our relationship with our wives, with our children, with our schools. Uh, with, with our politicians, with our nation, with ourselves. You know, one of the things that Bishop said last week is that the Abrahamic, that the new covenant rather, is the Abrahamic covenant on steroids. And if you understand how God blessed Abraham, even when he made a mistake, God blessed him because he had a grand covenant. It takes a lot of pressure off of you because we have inherited a brand of Christianity where where we have felt that half of the covenant is our responsibility and half is God's. That's Moses. That's not Jesus. And there's a lot of shifts that's taking place in our minds and our mindsets as we, con as we contemplate these things. I tell you, friends, this thing will change your prayer life but it's, as it has changed my prayer life. It will change how you look at life. It'll give you back your life. It'll give you back your life. You suddenly realize that you that you're not supposed to walk through this world singing, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. You know, no, no, no. you got the privilege now to actually enjoy this life and enjoy God. And God enjoy you and you enjoy others. And you share God with others. God, it takes the pressure off of Christianity. It takes the pressure out of being religious. I just love this, love this. Jesus does said the truth will make you free. And I'll tell you what, uh, before we forget, uh, we will receive a, a gift offering for our brother. Uh, we would like to bless him at the end of all of these sessions. And I have already given out the, uh, the PayPal information and, uh, and, and uh, you can send it there or send it to an account. We will make sure uh, that Bishop receives it. So welcome everyone, everyone from far and from near, from near and from far, all of you who are connecting with us from different parts of the world. We are so happy to have you. Let's lift our hands and Father, we bless you and we thank you. We give you praise that we live in a new covenant. We live in a new day. We live in a day, oh God, when the truth is setting us free and making us free. We declare that we are blessed and not cursed and redeem from the curse of the law. We declare that you are with us and for us and in us. We declare that greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. We thank you for this dimension of truth. So many are listening. So many are being, uh, so many are being changed. So many hearts are being converted. Somebody said, I feel as if I just got born again. And Father, we bless your people in the name of Jesus we declare that by the stripes of Jesus, we heal. I speak healing and I speak deliverance and I speak salvation to everyone that's on the call. I prophesy to your minds to be healed. I prophesy to your soul to be healed. I prophesy to your spirit to be healed. I prophesy to your bodies to be healed. I say, behold, let the crooked path be made straight, that the rough place be made smooth, in the name of Jesus, let every mountain, O oh God, be made into a valley. And let every valley be exalted. And Father, we bless your people. We release by the spirit of faith your blessing and your grace and your anointing and your favor upon your people. Oh, we lift our hands 
And let's say back to ourselves and even to those around us, I am blessed and not cursed. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I will live. I will not die. I will do the will of God and I will see the glory of God in the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. I am just going to share just a bit of, uh, of, of, of my screen and uh, uh, just mention a bit about uh, uh, our speaker here tonight. We, uh, we have done so before, but just to mention again, Jamie Inglehart is the president and founder of Connect International Ministries, a family of churches, ministries, businesses, and leaders, as well as an author. He serves as a bishop, overseer to those in CIM, as well as to many other leaders across the body of Christ. He is widely sought after for his unique multidimensional understanding of the kingdom of God, the new covenant, and the heart of the Father revealed through Jesus Christ. Jamie is married to Wendy, a recording artist, for over 29 years. They have ministered across the globe, serving as elders, church planters, Bible school teachers, spiritual parents, and itinerant ministers. And I understand he's also, he also has uh, grand, grandkids yeah, that he thoroughly, thoroughly enjoys. Uh, Bishop, it is, again, a privilege and a pleasure and honor to have you joining us in this part of the world. So many people around the world, as far one sister in Kenya tells me how much this world is affecting us. And so, sir, we are happy to have you. We are honored you could be here. And we want to introduce you right away to speak the word of the Lord to us. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Thank you Apostle. Appreciate that so much. Uh, it truly <clears throat> has been an honor for me also. Thank you. And for all of you that are listening and those that will listen, uh, again, I appreciate it. Uh, I, don't, I don't take any of uh, these types of opportunities for granted. Uh, I know that uh, we all have our spheres and our metrons of influence, and it's always a blessing when I'm able to kind of connect with other spheres uh, that maybe uh, have not heard me before, and so I'm, I'm truly honored. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I, I wanted to mention real quick, and I wanted to piggyback on a couple things that you said, and then we'll get right into the teaching. Uh, you know, you said someone mentioned something about feeling like almost like they got born again again. But, you know, if you really think about John chapter three, uh, you know, Jesus is speaking to a person in a religious system and, and it's in a religious system. The man says only one who, who is from God can do what you do. And Jesus said, you must be born again. Uh, in other words, uh, in order for you to truly see what the kingdom looks like, you need to come out of religion and you need to step into the kingdom. Uh, that passage is not just talking about someone, quote unquote, getting saved, even though that can apply to it. Uh, but it's talking to a Pharisee about coming out of the religious system and seeing them or, <clears throat> as you said, Apostle, how we view God has everything to do with how we see everything. If my view of God is wrong, then my view of myself will be wrong and ultimately my view of other people. Because however I see God is how I'll see myself because and especially how I see God in the scriptures, because Paul tells us the scriptures are a mirror that we beholding is in a mirror, the glory of God. We're changed into that image from glory to glory. <clears throat> and uh, that's 2 Corinthians 3. If you go down to chapter 4, and it tells us what we're supposed to be looking at, and it's in the face of Jesus Christ. So if we mainly hear and understand a lot about Jesus from the scriptures, then how we view Jesus has everything to do with how we'll then view ourselves. Now, the scriptures are a mirror that reflects back on not only who God is in Christ, but also then who we now are in him, and then how we view humanity. Uh, most of the wars that we've experienced, the crazy things that people have used the Bible to interpret everything from, in the United States, the KKK, Okay, who claims to be a Christian organization, to slavery, uh, to so many things that have been attested actually to Christianity in some form by using the holy book, but using it out of context and ultimately removing Jesus from it and, and just viewing it a certain way. It's amazing to me how you can actually quote Jesus to somebody and they'll try to rebuke what Jesus said by quoting Moses to you. 
I mean, it, it literally blows me away how there's times I've gotten discussions with people and actually said, and people have said, well, yeah, but there's these five other scriptures over here in the Old Testament that, that kind of go against that. I'm like, well, but Jesus trumps all of it. Jesus trumps everything. Because again, and I know I've said this every single class so far, <clears throat> and I probably say it every sermon I preach in some form, John 1.18, no man has seen God at any time until Jesus, who came from the Father, revealed him. So nobody got God right till Jesus showed up. Jesus is our example. So when we read and study scripture, we must view everything through the lens of Jesus, but also we learned last week through the lens of covenant. Uh, and we're going to look now this week at what proper hermeneutics says, historical context, uh, and all the wonderful nuances of actual biblical interpretation. But let me read uh, just a couple of verses that I believe are very important. I've mentioned them, but I want to read them exactly. Romans 15, 4 says, whatever things were written beforehand, which of course is talking about the Old Testament because that was written before Paul would have been writing this, were written for our learning that we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures may have hope. First Corinthians 10, 11 says something very similar. Now, all of these things happen to them in the Old Testament as examples, or I think it's the King James that says end samples, which were types and shadows, and they were written for our admonition for whom the end of the ages <clears throat> has now come. And of course, the beautiful part about that is it doesn't say the end of the ages that will come, but it's the end of the ages that has now come. Jesus was the culmination of the ages. Now, there are more than 300 figures of speech in Scripture. Scripture is full of idioms, hyperbole, metaphor, simile, allegory, type, symbols, shadows, and numbers that all meant something different to them many times than it does to us. <clears throat> I, I like to use this example. Uh, imagine if uh, I was able to go back in time and I go back to 1940 and I explain to my grandmother, who at that time was just a young woman, and I tell her, that in 2022, I have a picture of her and I on my Facebook page. And I've talked about her on Facebook. Well, my grandmother in 1940 uh, would look at me and say, what's Facebook? The only thing she'd be able to comprehend is, son, is your face in a book somewhere? That's the only thing she could comprehend. But yet we take what was written 2000 or 1900 and some years ago to 5,000 or so years ago, when you cover the whole Testament <clears throat> and we try to apply it through a 21st century lens without understanding who it was first written to <clears throat> and how they understood it. And I will say this again and again and again, the Bible was not written to any of us in 2022. It was written for us, but it was not written to us. So we must know what did it mean to who it was originally written to, and then we apply it for us today because the Holy Spirit is still breathing on the scriptures. He still gives fresh revelation today. He gives applications that are beautiful, but the interpretation is different than the application. Now, proper interpretation starts with proper hermeneutics. Now, hermeneutics, uh, the definition is the methodology of interpretation, especially the interpretation of biblical text, ancient literature, and philosophical text. So hermeneutics is literally the science, if you may, of interpreting ancient literature, because there's actually a way to do it, to properly do it and properly understand it. It's also the art of understanding and of making oneself understood. So it's one thing to get understanding, it's another thing to make oneself understood. Whenever I preach a message and someone comes up to me and they say, man, you know, that really, that was really great. And that spoke to me. I always tell them, I said, well, thank you. Because my main goal is that it would make as much sense to you as it made to me when God dropped it in my heart. Because if it only makes sense to me 
and I have the understanding, but I can't make anyone else understand what I'm talking about. And by helping uh, impart to them that ultimately I've really not done my job as a preacher and teacher of the gospel. Now the word hermeneutics is derived from a Greek word, meaning to translate or to interpret and to bring explanation. I think that's one of the biggest things. I mean, Proverbs tells us in all you're getting, get understanding, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. It's one thing to get knowledge. It's another thing to know how to apply it and actually get understanding. Now, hermeneutics is normally broke down in four, four specific dimensions. The first one is literal. And that simply is dealing with a biblical text is to be deciphered according to the plain meaning expressed by its language and historical context. In other words, when it says Jesus wept, he literally wept. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't get a spiritual understanding of that. It doesn't mean that there's not a deeper prophetic revelation in there. But ultimately, when it says Jesus wept, he literally wept. All right. And so that, that we know that's simple. Uh, of course, it's also, uh, was that John 11, 25 or 35, uh, when I was growing up and you know, I was in Sunday school and they told you to say a scripture. That was always my go-to one because it was easiest one to remember. Jesus wept. Uh, so anybody could memorize that verse. Uh, but uh, first of all, is the literal. What did it literally mean and literally say? Secondly, is called the moral interpretation. It's an interpretation that searches for the moral lessons, which can be understood from the writings in the scriptures. Allegories can also be placed in this category. Uh, number three is allegorical. It's an interpretation that states that the scriptures have another level or more reference that is more than the people, events, and things that are literally said. Under allegorical interpretation is also typological, where people, events, and things are a shadow, meaning actually something else. Fourthly, it's called anagogical. Yeah, that's a very hard word to say, A-N-A-G-O-G-I-C-A-L. It's mainly known as the mystical interpretation. It claims to explain the events of the Bible and how they relate to or predict what the future holds. We would simply call it prophetic. This is seen in the Jewish Kabbalah, which attempts to reveal the mystical significance of the numerical values of Hebrew words and letters. Uh, because uh, this, this scripture that we study, this Bible that has been put all together, is a beautiful book that uh, it, it, it has so uh, many meanings and so much understanding and so much revelation and so many things tied together in such a beautiful tapestry and beautiful poem, but you have to understand how to understand it and interpret it. Now, what we will focus on uh, in, in this first part is three main areas of interpretation. Number one is the historical. Historical deals with audience relevance, which was who was it first written to and spoken to. It can't mean something to them that is completely different to us. Uh, that would make it extremely irrelevant to them. Let me give you a simple example. Uh, you know, we, we, can't, we can't read the Apostle Paul in the book of Thessalonians telling the church at Thessalonica to watch out uh, you know, to be careful because there's this, there's this falling away. There is this, uh, there is this uh, delusion that's going to come on the body of Christ and they need to guard against it. But actually Paul told them to guard against it, but really it didn't have anything to do with them. That actually was for us 2000 years later. I mean, it literally doesn't make any sense for us to ultimately jump that 2000 years in the future and cause it to mean something to us, that first of all, it meant something to the people he was writing it to. They were literally looking for the things Paul was saying, because Paul was expecting those things to happen in their lifetime. Okay. Paul didn't say, now keep an eye out for this, but psych, I'm just kidding. All right. I, I don't really mean it. Uh, this really isn't even for you at all. So if it, if I don't understand that uh, historical understanding, if I don't understand what that great apostasy would be, all right, another example of historical context is the whole chapter of Matthew 24. 
All right. Matthew 24, uh, which is Jesus uh, giving the Olivet Discourse. And Jesus is explaining in Matthew 24 what he first talked about in Matthew 23. And in Matthew 23, he's discussing how the temple was going to be destroyed in three days, how Israel was going to be laid flat. According to, according to Micah, Zion would become a plowed field and not one stone would be standing in the temple and that all of the blood from Abel all the way through would be visited on that generation because time after time he sent the prophets he sent the men and women of God. Now he sent him his own son and the Jews continually rejected him. And he said, okay, now all of this has been adding up. I've been patient with you now for these four, you know, four or 5,000 years. And now this is what's going to happen. And so then Matthew 24, uh, the people, uh, the, the, the disciples turn to Jesus and say, okay, well, master, when shall these things be? When shall what things be? The things you just talked about in Matthew 23. And when shall be the sign of your coming, which is what he talked about all through in Matthew 23. And he gives Matthew 24 and he says, in the last days. Now, we automatically take last days and we throw that 2,000 years into the future and think it's talking about the end of time. When he's actually talking about the last days of Jerusalem, he's talking in historical context. Now, uh, let me say this. Regardless of your eschatology and your end time view, even people that are futurists uh, many times will tell you that Matthew 24, they will say it has a, a double meaning. They, they, many, many will say that there's a double uh, fulfillment of prophecy, which I don't believe there is such a thing. There's only a fulfillment of prophecy, and then there's prophetic uh, types and shadows that, that may have some prophetic pictures. Uh, but it's not a fulfillment because it can't be fulfilled twice. There's not going to be two Jesuses. There's not going to be two virgin births. All right. It, it was declared one time about him. And, and then that's, that's what we grab hold to. But now for us to take it and interpret it and say, well, this is talking about us because we look at the news and there's wars and there's rumors of wars and there's all of this stuff going on without first understanding who Jesus was speaking to. He was speaking to Jews and I always say it like this, he was speaking to Jews, not Jews, and to the Jews he was speaking to that were alive at that moment. He said, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. He was speaking literally to the people that were standing there. That's the literal historical understanding. Now, I leave room in my theology. Now, I personally believe that all of that was fulfilled in the first century, so fulfilled in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. That's my personal belief, but I also leave room in my theology for some future events because the truth is none of us really know. And that's why I love to tell people like next about three weeks, it's going to be a, a six hour e-course on eschatology. And the one thing I say over and over again is all of these views, which is four major views, all four are possibilities. None of them are certainties because they're all called theory. The truth is the afterlife we don't really know about. We've not been there. All we can do is theorize about things that we understand in scripture, and then we do our best to interpret them. But most people don't interpret the historical and cultural, which is what did it mean to the original audience? Because to that original audience, those things literally started taking place over the next 40 years. When Jesus said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, there the, the, everybody alive at that time had been living under something called the Pax Romana. It had been nearly 400 years of peace. There had been no war. Nobody in that era knew war at all. There had been nothing but peace in the Roman Empire. And so literally over the next few years, war started taking place, famines, droughts. Uh, Ephesus was nearly destroyed by an earthquake. I mean, all of this stuff started taking place over the next 37, 38 years that Jesus said that it would. But then Jesus makes some stuff that you have to be so careful interpreting. Uh, Jesus said something, and I think I mentioned this in, in one of our, uh, I think our first session, but I believe it's important for me to reiterate it. Uh, I have run into so many people as I've traveled for the last 32 years who've been afraid to have children. Because in Matthew 24, Jesus said, woe to the woman who is, uh, what, what are the woman who is uh, pregnant in those days or a woman who is uh, nursing a baby, she should pray that this, he's talking about the, this great tribulation that was coming, that it would not happen in winter 
and that it would not happen on the Sabbath. Now, what blows me away is I had a young lady in North Texas one time come up to me after I preached a message, and she said, you said one thing in the sermon. She said, do you not believe in a future tribulation? And I learned a long time ago, I don't come out and preach that stuff most places I go, but he that has ears will hear. I'll drop little nuggets, and someone will come up and say, wait a minute, you said something. And I, and I said to her, I said, no, I said, I believe that tribulation was the Jewish tribulation that happened in the first century. And she said, I've been terrified my whole life to have children. She said, when I had my firstborn son, I was terrified till he was about five years old. So he could then run with me so we could run away from the Antichrist and, and we could head to the hills. And I said to her, I said, okay. I said, well, l- l- let me ask you just a couple of questions. She said, okay. I said, that verse says, Woe to the woman who's pregnant in those days. I said, okay, so you've been afraid to get pregnant. Now you're pregnant. You have a five-year-old son, but you're afraid to have any more children. She said, yes, sir. I said, well, why would you in the 21st century living in North Texas need to worry about the wintertime? Matter of fact, why would anybody in the, uh, the South in the United States, why would anybody in Mexico, Central America, South America, Africa, Australia, most of the Southern Hemisphere ever need to worry about running anywhere in wintertime because your winters aren't bad? And she just looked at me and she said, I don't know. I've never thought about it. I said, let me ask you the second question. I said, why would you as a Gentile in the 21st century need to worry about going anywhere on the Sabbath day since we're not under Sabbath laws and Sabbath rules because Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath? And she said, I don't know. I never thought about it. I said, well, well, then when you go over to the book of Luke, Jesus is is pretty much saying the same thing. I think it's Luke 16 that is the, the, the mirror image of Matthew 24. And Jesus says in Luke 16, he said, also, he said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, if you're on your rooftop, don't go down in your house, but jump off the roof and head for the hills. And I said to her, have you ever been on your rooftop? She said, I've never been on my rooftop. I said, are there any hills by your house? She said, it's flat. I said, maybe he wasn't talking to you. I mean, I know that like oversimplifies it, but it blows me away how we will take these verses and try to bring them in to the present without ever considering who Jesus was first talking to. Matter of fact, at the beginning of Matthew 24, he says, those in Jerusalem and Judea are ones that will flee. Not in, not in Indiana, where I live, not in, uh, you know, not in Africa not in South America, not in Canada, uh, not in, in, the, in the Caribbean islands. No, he said, those who live in Judea, okay? We don't live in Judea. So obviously he was specifically talking to a specific people at a specific time. But if we don't understand that, then we will try to interpret something without its historical understanding. Let me give you a few other simple examples. Um, I, I, I have a good friend that's a long ago. He, he put on Facebook that his life's verse uh, was Joshua chapter one. And, and I knew what he meant by it. You know, I inboxed him and gave him a hard time and teased him. But, you know, it's Joshua one verse eight, that if you meditate in the law of God day and night, then he will cause all your ways to prosper. And I, I sent him an inbox and I said, um, so do you meditate on the 613 laws of Moses day and night? And he said, well, no, of course not. I'm in the new covenant. I said, well, well how is, why is that your life verse? Well, why would your life verse be if I meditate on the law of God, which is talking about the law of Moses there, uh, then all my ways will be prosperous. I said, the truth is uh, we don't meditate on the law of God. We meditate on the true law of God, which is the law of love, because we're not under the law of Moses anymore. Uh, uh, you know, you also see this anytime you see the Christian television stations, and it's time for them to raise money. They hardly ever use, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but when it comes time to raise money, they hardly ever use New Testament verses. It's nearly always Old Testament. And they'll come up with some offering from the Old Testament that has nothing to do with anybody in the New Covenant nowadays. But, but they, all, they love the verse in Deuteronomy. And, and I love the verse too, that it is the Lord, it is he that gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish covenant with you. Uh, But the problem is in context, historical context, is the covenant he was talking about establishing with them was the covenant that he gave Moses, which again was not a grant covenant. It was a kinship covenant. It was a two-way covenant. In other words, God says, if you do your part, then I'll do my part. 
the good news in the covenant we are now in is we are blessed, not because of anything we do. We're blessed because of everything that Jesus did. Now he gives us the power to get wealth simply because he's given us all of his wealth already. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly Christ. There's nothing that we need. He that, he that offered up his own son, shall he not freely give us all things? He's not holding out on us. Now we're blessed to be a blessing. But what we do is we pull those verses out because, again, we give the whole Bible the same value when the whole Bible doesn't have the same value. The truth is all of the Bible is important, and I'm going to reiterate this again. All of the Bible is God-breathed, God inspired it, and he breathed on it, but it does not all have equal value. The new trumps the old. We live in a new covenant. It's a better covenant with better blood and better promises and better blessings. Uh, th this is the beauty of living now post-cross and in this resurrection life that has now been given to us in the finished work when Jesus declared to Telestai, it is finished, it is completed. That's the beauty of it. So if I read those verses and and I try to interpret them as God is saying that to me without first. Now, it doesn't mean that God can't speak that to me. It doesn't mean that he can't apply it to me and let it be a revelation to me. But when I'm teaching it and interpreting it, I must say, Joshua 1 verse 8, God here says that if we meditate on the law of God day and night, he'll cause all of our ways to prosper. Now, this is what God said to Joshua. This is what he said to the Jews under the covenant that they had. Now, how does this apply to us today? How it applies to us today is now we meditate on the law of God, which the, the commandment, which is love one another as I've loved you. And we meditate on the goodness of God and what God now says about us. He's going to cause all our ways to prosper. And is it still applicable? Absolutely. But if I'm interpreting it, I have to, first of all, start with the historical context. If I don't give the historical context, I can't call it interpretation. I can call it a sermon. I can call it a teaching. But I can't say this is what this means. It can only mean what it meant to the audience it was spoken to. So I, I hope I can't. I don't think I can make that any clearer. But it's extremely important to understand that because what it causes you to do now when you read certain passages is I have to look at those passages and I have to find out what did the people then think? How did they think? How did they believe? What, 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 what did this mean to them? I, I mean, you know, when, when, when Jesus said things like, uh, you know, when and this is a little bit of a study I've been doing here lately, when Jesus said things like, uh, uh, or in, in, and Paul, especially Paul dealt quite a bit with sexual immorality. And Paul's like, don't even let there be a hint of sexual immorality amongst you. And we hear the word sexual immorality and we hear the word fornication. And we automatically in our brain, we go to any type of sex that is outside of marriage. Uh, now I'm not saying that culturally that's not true, but to a first century Jew and the people living in the first century, Sexual immorality, when you look up the word for it, it's pornea, where we get the word pornography from. And to a first century Jew or first century individual, sexual immorality uh, was actually sleeping with prostitutes. It was prostitution. And so the meaning of it there was dealing more with even temple prostitutes. And it was all about temple worship more than it was anything else. Matter of fact, it's interesting when you do a study on human sexuality, up until like the 1930s, fornication was considered any sex, even in marriage, that wasn't for procreation. So if, if you weren't connecting with your wife in sex to have a baby, then it was considered fornication. So it, it's just interesting when you actually do a little bit of a study and all that, but we automatically take sexual morality. We're like, well, I know exactly what that means because this is what it means to us today. But, but, but wait a minute, if we're interpreting it, what did it mean to the people that Paul was first speaking to? Extremely important to understand that. Now, how do we apply it today? And what is sexual immorality today? Because it's more of a cultural issue uh, th than it is, you know, quote unquote, sin issues and everything else. And so should we still abstain from sexual immorality? Absolutely. Uh, but, but I need to still understand what that means in order to give a proper interpretation of it. If I don't know what it means, I won't be able to give the full understanding. So anyway, that's the historical. Secondly is the grammatical. 
Uh, the gra grammatical is when you study the grammar, the original Hebrew and Greek, as well as I like to throw Aramaic in there because Aramaic is what they actually were speaking in the first century. And I'd encourage you, if you don't have one, uh, you can, you, I think you can download pretty much for free. There's Aramaic translations of the scripture. And I'd always encourage you to take verses and not only look up the original Greek in the New Testament, but also look up the Aramaic translation. Very interesting sometimes in just uh, how, how some of that turns out, which is, I, I think I gave the example, uh, it was, it was, I think it was in how in the book of Matthew, uh, the, the writer of Matthew actually quotes uh, a passage about that Jesus quoted, and he said, uh, this is fulfilled as was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, when it was actually the prophet Zechariah that said it. But what's interesting is when you go back to the Aramaic text, which is older than the Greek, name a prophet. So a lot of times the translators, when they translated from one to the other, they went and added the name of a prophet in there that actually maybe wasn't even supposed to be put in there. And so that's why we study to show ourselves approved. We don't read to show ourselves approved. We study the scriptures, not just read the scriptures. Matter of fact, uh, I get argued with all the time. I had actually the president of a Bible school, okay? Uh, a president of an actual Bible school wanted to argue with me one time and said, because I went on Facebook and I, I made a post. All I said was this, that in order to be able to properly interpret scripture, we need to understand some Hebrew, some Greek, some Aramaic, and in the New Testament, also understand Second Temple Judaism, which Second Temple Jews were very different than First Temple Jews, because First Temple Jews were full-blown Old Testament Jews. Second Temple Jews had been inundated with 400 years of Plato and Socrates in Greek thought. That is why by the time Jesus showed up, Jesus and the apostles were not even reading the Old Testament out of a Hebrew text, but they were reading out of a Greek text because all the Hebrew had been interpreted to Greek. So Greek thought had inundated uh, the, the second temple Jews. And so that's very important to understand when you interpret a lot of things that you find in the New Testament, because it's going to be different than just Old Testament Jews, uh, because Old Testament Jews, things were like just pretty clear. Not only that, but by the time Jesus showed up, second temple Judaism, the scribes and Pharisees, had added 365 prohibitions to the law and over 240 more laws to it. And so by the time Jesus showed up, there was over 1,100, I think over 1,100 rules that they were meant to keep at that time. So just crazy. Of course, that's why, you know, Jesus in the Message Bible says, anybody weary, anybody tired, anybody burned out in religion. And of course, everybody was like, yes, yes, and yes. We are exhausted with this stuff. That's why Jesus said to the, a lot of the Pharisees, he's like, you guys don't even keep the law. He said, matter of fact, you're so focused on these other 400 and some things that you've added to the law. You're not even doing what Moses said in the first place because you've added all this stuff to it. So anyway, on this post, that's all I said to properly interpret, not properly preach. Because I said to you last week, you can pastor 50 years and never interpret the Bible. All right. You can preach it without interpreting it. You just have to not say this is what this means. You say this is how this applies to us today. But he answered me back and he said, are you saying, he commented on my post, he said, are you saying that in order to properly interpret scripture, I have to understand Hebrew, Greek, some uh, Second Temple Judaism and, and historical context? I said, yeah, that's exactly what I said. He said, well, that's ridiculous. He said, according to 1 John, all I need is the Holy Spirit in my Bible. And, and I said, so in order to properly understand an ancient text, He's like, all I need is the Holy Spirit in my Bible, because John said, no man will teach you, but the Holy Spirit will teach you. And he said, exactly. And I said, the problem is, is you were told that by a man who was teaching you that. <laughs> it wasn't the Holy Spirit that said that to you. It was John who was inspired by the Holy Spirit who actually wrote it down. So it was actually a man who taught you that. And according to Ephesians 4, we can't even grow as the church and mature without fivefold ministry. So we obviously need other people, and we need to understand one another uh, to be able to properly interpret the scriptures anyway, which is why it is Paul that said the scriptures are not for private interpretation. So it doesn't matter how much it means to you. 
It's not about just what it means to you. It's about what it actually means. And I mentioned last week, you, the Eastern church interprets in community. They interpret corporately because it's like, what, what did God speak to you? What is God saying to you? What is God saying to you? And then what was the original historical context? What is the Greek saying this? What is the Hebrew? Let's put it all together and let's dialogue about this and let's come up with what it actually means rather than just what it says. I have people that can quote scripture to me up one side and down the other, and they know what the Bible says, but they don't know what the Bible means. You can quote scripture to your blue in the face and not understand what it is talking about. A few examples of this. All right. Well, let me, let me finish this. The one thing that was interesting is this man who I, I love to this day, and we just disagree about this. He then quotes to me a verse and he tells me what the Greek meant in that verse. And so I commented back and said, thank you for proving my point because the Holy Spirit didn't teach you that Greek word. You went to a Strong's Concordance and got the meaning of that. So obviously it took more than just the Bible and the Holy Spirit. You needed another book to go to, to understand it. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that it's just me and the Holy Spirit and a Bible and, and I can understand all this stuff. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Okay. It just, <laughs> let me just say this loudly to all the Pentecostal charismatics who, if you were like me, we were taught, that's all you need. All you need is a download from heaven. You need more than a download from heaven, okay? I'm just here to tell you, download from heaven gives you revelation, but actual interpretation and understanding is you have to know the historical and the grammatical. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, in the Greek language, love uh, has more than one meaning. In, in English, love can mean anything from I love hot dogs to I love my dog uh, to I love my wife and my kids. Uh, I mean, we have pretty much one meaning for the word love. In the Greek, there's many meanings for the word love. And if you don't understand the proper meaning, you're going to misunderstand some things when it's taught. All right. Uh, that, 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 is, that is why it's so important to understand what the actual language is declaring. Now, uh, one thing I want to encourage you to get, I don't know if uh, you may already have one, but there is a Bible called the Exegesis Bible. And it was written by a man, I think his name is Gilbert Gian. Uh, he's a, a Jewish man. And I think you have to actually go to his website. I don't think you can order it from Amazon or anything else. That might have changed. It's not cheap, but it's a brilliant translation because what he does is he, on the left-hand side, uh, he gives like the, uh, the like the King James language of a text. And then to the right, he gives you the literal. I mean, like so literal, like sentences don't make sense. Okay. Like, uh, like I said, with Spanish, uh, if you wanted to say, hello, how are you? You would say, hola, como esta usted? But actually, literally, it's hello, how you are. And so he takes on the right hand side, and he's a Hebrew scholar, and, and, and he puts in there what the actual language says. And so it gives you understanding of some things just reading that side and you're going, Oh my Lord. Uh, you know, and then it causes you to go look it up and study it. It's one of my favorite Bibles to just study some stuff in like a great example, uh, Acts chapter two, verse one, you know, there came a sound from heaven uh, as a mighty rushing violent wind and it filled the house. Uh, but in, in the original Greek, it literally reads uh, there came a, there came from heaven, a bearing forceful puff. It's like a, uh, the, the, this breath that was just released. Uh, I mean, just it, it's some beautiful stuff when you actually study it. It gives some great understanding. A great example also is Zephaniah chapter three, like verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over you with joy. He will joy over you with singing or shouting. And he actually puts the original Hebrew word there for singing or shouting, which is the Hebrew word gil which means to leap up and spin uncontrollably with great emotion. And so it literally says that, that when salvation takes place, that the Lord, he leaps up and spins uncontrollably over you with emotion. Well, that, that, that gives a total different understanding than he's just singing or he's just shouting. It's like, because I think we've got this, this idea of God, the father in heaven with a big, long white beard sitting on a throne, uh, you know, with this stoic look on his face. When the truth is <clears throat> we're told uh, by Jesus that, Every time a sinner repents, it says there's rejoicing. Uh, the, it doesn't say, actually doesn't say the angels rejoice. That's we read that into it. It actually says there's rejoicing in the presence of angels. 
well, why aren't angels rejoicing? Well, it's not that angels may not be rejoicing, but angels have never been lost, so they don't know what it means to be found. So it's not angels rejoicing, but who's in the presence of angels, the Father, the Son, uh, the Holy Spirit, that literally the Godhead is doing a dance, all right? They're rejoicing, they're singing. There's joy in heaven. It's not a drag. It's not boring. It's enjoyable. But when you read that stuff from the original language, it gives a total different picture than just us reading certain things. Let me give you another simple example. <clears throat> in Isaiah, uh, it, it, it gives us in the text, uh, and I, I can't remember the exact, I encourage you to look this up. I didn't have this in my notes. It kind of, uh, this just hit me. This is a little rabbit trail. So just allow me to go down this road for a minute. Uh, but, but it says that God will share his glory with no man. Now, the translators in nearly every translation put the phrase no man because the Hebrew doesn't make sense. The Hebrew actually says God will not share his glory with any behinders. It's literally a Hebrew word that means a behinder. I remember that bugged me probably for about three months. <clears throat> and that passage wouldn't go away from me. I mean, I was meditating on it. I, I was asking the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me. Before the cross, we were behinders uh, because God was. God was behind a veil and we were behind a veil. In other words, we did not clearly see him. There was a veil in the way. So he was not sharing his glory with any man or any behinder. But then Jesus in John 17, in the real Lord's prayer, his high priestly prayer, he says, Father, the glory that I've had with you in the beginning, I now give it to them. Why? Because we're no longer behinders. The veil has been removed. Now Paul says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And Peter says, we rejoice. It literally means to leap up and down with joy unspeakable and full of doxazo is the Greek word. It means manifested glory. In other words, if you want to see the glory manifest, start jumping up and down because if this wine skin would ever start jumping up and down, the cork may just pop and some wine just might come oozing out. I'm, I'm just here to say that this world is longing for the wine and the glory that we are carrying. But it, it, it's only in studying those grammatical understandings that we get that kind of life that is not only a grammatical understanding and historical, but it's also revelation that, that comes alive in our souls. Uh, and so th there's so much more on the grammatical side. I just want to encourage you, uh, you know, use biblehub.com, Bible Gateway. There's wonderful things you can look up online, look up the Hebrew, look up the Greek, look up the Aramaic, uh, get some understanding. Don't just, uh, don't just be a, a good Western Christian and, and just Please don't practice old McDonald theology. Here a verse, there a verse, everywhere a verse, verse, okay? Uh, the truth is you can prove whatever you want by just spitting verses out all over the place. And it doesn't mean that it's producing any life for anybody. I can take verses out of context and make up any kind of doctrine that I want to make up and, and believe any kind of system that I want to believe. But that's not how this works, all right? So stop giving straw man arguments with people you disagree with by just throwing verses out there, okay? That's not the point of it. I have to understand what that verse actually means. Now, the third one is prophetic. Uh, and the prophetic uh, interpretation is what is the truth or revelation behind the truth? And what does it mean now to us and for us? And what is the application for today. Uh, the prophetic text is all of these wonderful pictures that God has. You know, uh, uh, I'm going to give you just a few simple examples, because in the next few weeks, I'm going to go over a lot of the allegories and metaphors in scripture that are full of prophetic uh, vision and revelation. Uh, there is a man one day that is trying to see Jesus, and his name is Zacchaeus, but Zacchaeus can't see Jesus because of two reasons. Number one, is he short physically? And number two, is the crowd that was in the way. And I just submit to you that a beautiful application of that is the word Zacchaeus means pure. And that Zacchaeus is a picture of every single human in the human race that purely on the inside is longing to see the real Jesus. They're not longing for religion. They're longing purely to see Jesus. But what hinders most people from seeing Jesus is they have a short mindset because yes, he was physically short, but we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And when we begin to think that we're less,
less than, it's hard for us to see who God really is because we're devaluing ourselves. And then it says that it was the crowd that kept him from seeing Jesus. Most of the time, what keeps people from really seeing the real Jesus is not Jesus. It's the crowd running with Jesus. It's all the pharisaical attitudes. It's the separatist. It's a lot of times the representatives of Jesus that is so maligned his visage that people can't see who he really is because we preached a Jesus plus the law, a Jesus that is marred rather than a pure Jesus, that is purely new covenant, that is pure love and pure light and pure life. And so he has to climb up onto a tree. See, the, the beautiful thing is the word tree there is actually, it was a sycamore tree, which is translated a a uh, a uh, immature or a, a, a not full uh, uh, fig tree. So it, it gives this, this wonderful picture because we know the fig tree was dealing with Israel. It gives a picture of this tree that wasn't a perfect tree, but it was also a picture of us because we are called trees of righteousness. And sometimes the only way people are ever going to see Jesus is they're going to have to climb up on our lives and pick the fruit because what we have to be rooted and grounded in love for them to climb up on us so they can see who Jesus really is. That is why Jesus one day, uh, he pray, prays for a blind man. And it's, he says to the man, what do you see? He said, I see men walking as trees. Well, first of all, trees don't walk around. Trees are rooted and trees are grounded. I submit to you that he actually gave the man spiritual sight before he gave him natural sight. Uh, because natural sight is a beautiful thing. And I've heard people preach that you got to keep praying. Jesus didn't heal him the first time because you got to keep asking. But I submit to you that Jesus healed him spiritually and gave him spiritual sight because what was walking around Jesus was Pharisees and Sadducees, who they were trees that had no root system. They were not rooted and grounded in love. And what he gave them a vision of was the religious system that was walking around. Then he prays for his eyes and he sees because real spiritual insight is more important sometimes than even just natural sight. And so you can get all this wonderful revelation out of all of this understanding on something as simple as a story that literally happened. The story was literal. There was a literal man by the name of Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus in the Greek means pure. So you look up the grammatical side, but then prophetically, how does that apply to us today? We need to allow people to climb up on our fruit and pick the fruit of our lives and, and show for who Jesus really is and get away. And it's our job to let them know that, listen, Yes, all the sin and come short of the glory of God, but now because of what Jesus did at the cross, now we've been made righteous. So stop feeling little and small because of what Jesus did. You can now arise in your understanding and you can arise in your consciousness and you can begin to see who he really is. And so there's wonderful prophetic revelation. So when I'm doing proper hermeneutics, I got to know what is historical context study the grammar, but then also pull out the prophetic, which is the application, and what is God saying? You see, the historical is what God said. God actually said that to an individual. But Revelation says, he that is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And so what we did in a lot of the charismatic church is we put our whole focus on the prophetic and what God is saying, but then we called what God is saying as the meaning because we never understood, first of all, what God said. And you can only understand what God said by understanding the historical uh, and the grammatical. So hopefully that's making sense. Now, uh, let me, let me, I'm almost done. I got to wind this down. Uh, the next is after you understand hermeneutics, you must understand exegesis, E-X-E-G-E-S-E-S. And the word exegesis means to lead out or to pull out what it means in context. Exegesis also includes the study of the historical and cultural backgrounds of the author, text, and original audience. The term exegesis and hermeneutics can be used interchangeably and have been for many years. The opposite of exegesis is eisegesis. The word eisegesis means to lead into or interpret from outside of scripture and then try to read into the passage something that is not there. When someone is practicing eisegesis, they are importing or drawing their own conclusions and opinions, which leads to personal interpretations that are unsupported by the text itself. Paul tells us the scripture is not for private interpretation. That is why the Eastern Church interpreted in 
community. And so I must understand that it is not my job to read into the text something I want it to mean, but I read out of the text what is actually there. That is why it is so important to understand the difference because uh, we can come up with any kind of idea and revelation we want and then go try to find scriptures for it. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a simple example. I remember back, back in the 90s, uh, I was preaching a series of message on sonship. And I was preaching at a church in Missouri and this man in his late 70s, he walked up to me and I'd preach Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Sunday morning after the service, he walked up and he said, I've listened to you now for three services. And he said, young man, he said, I would, I, I just would swear that you have read all of Bill Britton's books and you are now preaching all of Bill, Bill Britton's message. And I said, you know, I think I've heard the name Bill Britton before, but I've never read any of his books. He said, you're kidding me. He said, I sat under Bill Britton in Springfield, Missouri for over 40 years. And he said, I'm telling you, you use the same language you use the same examples. You, you literally sound just like Bill Britton. And I was blown away. Well, that night at the service, he brought to me a stack of all of Bill Britton's books that he'd ever written. And he gave them to me. So on my flight home the next day, I'm reading through these books and I'm going crazy because we literally had the same, uh, like, like I drew up in my notes, all of the threes in, in, in the scripture. And I lined up all the threes, you know, outer court, inner court, holy of holies, uh, you know, Passover, Pentecost, tabernacles. And I put them on top of each other. And all the, all the ones are the outer court, all the twos are the inner court, all the threes are the holy of holies. And I, I walked through all of that. Uh, this is before I'd met anybody that knew anything about any of that. And he literally had the same diagram in his notes. And, and, and I mean, it, it literally blew me away. And so I gobbled up all of his stuff as the stuff he was, he was sharing was some great stuff. But then uh, I got a hold of some of his later stuff in the seventies. And he started, uh, he started preaching this whole idea uh, on, on the, on the manifest sons of God in Joel's army. And pretty much there would be a whole group of people that would manifest their glorified body before Jesus, you know, before actually uh, uh, the resurrection and, 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 and different things. And, and then begin to teach that, uh, you know, there would be no death and, and nobody would need to die. And, and there's people that are still teaching that today. And I just say, Hey, as your faith be, so be it unto you. But then there was some stuff he started teaching that just went awry. And I remember talking to my spiritual mama, if you should pick it about it. And I was talking to her about the sons of God. And she said, son, that's some great stuff. Dive into it, but just beware. Because what happens is when someone gets a revelation of something, they then start to see it all over scripture, which is not a bad thing, but then they try to read into it stuff that's not even there. And that's when you practice eisegesis. And when you practice eisegesis, that's the stuff that can put you into error. Where exegesis is reading out what's actually there, eisegesis is reading in something that's perhaps uh, not even there in the first place, but something that you decided or that you just came up with. So in areas of interpretation, there's only one interpretation, but many applications. There's only one interpretation, but they're multidimensional. They're pictures behind the pictures. Uh, uh, Apostle uh, Calvin and I's very good friend, Dr. Lynn Hiles, I've heard him say this for more than 20 years. Truth is like an onion. The more you peel it, the more layers you find. And it's amazing how the scripture is beautifully multi-layered and there's wonderful revelation behind it. But again, there's a difference between interpretation, application, and the revelation. And that is doing proper exegesis compared to eisegesis and proper hermeneutics. So anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there for this week. And then next week uh, we'll be able to get into all of those different uh, areas of interpretation. So uh, hopefully that made sense to y'all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Excellent. The science of interpretation. I'm going to ask some people to chime in, but let me just remind you of some of the things we heard tonight. Uh, there is a difference between interpretation and application. And um, tonight we dealt with the, hermeneutics, the science of interpretation. A couple of things uh, the bishop said. Nobody got God right until Jesus showed up. Jesus was the culmination of the ages. Not everything in the Bible was written for us, but not everything was written necessarily to us, but it was written for us. Proper interpretation starts with a proper hermeneutic. 
the science of interpretation. We explored some things that were literal, uh, some things that are prophetic, and some things that are historical. Uh, for example, when the Bible talks about the last days, is not really talking to us necessarily. It's, the last days pertain to the last days of Judaism. And I know that's a big that's a biggie for a lot of people here. But, and uh, we I believe we do have a uh, certain uh, mindsets of what we call the last day in the earth, but we've always had those mindsets. I believe that we that the last days that Jesus is talking about, even Paul is talking about, took place under Judaism. And that came to an end. We don't know all that's in the future. For example, nobody could have predicted coronavirus. And I think people who are looking to find coronavirus in the Bible have made a serious mistake. The tribulation uh, it was a Jewish tribulation. AD 70 is not something in our future. Matthew 24 uh, is not for us in the 21st century. Now, it's a big one for a lot of people, but it's not for us in the 21st century. My friends, uh, you know, th th we've got no mountains to run into. We in Trinidad have no snow. Uh, we've got no winter to run from. Uh, you know, th there are no gates in the city to close here in Trinidad or, or, or anywhere in the Caribbean. You know, uh, we, we, ladies and gentlemen, some things are just, just do not make sense. We are blessed because of what he has done, not because of what we have done. God, I love this. At, at salvation, God jumps up and he spins around uncontrollably with, with emotion. That's a big one for me. That's a big one for me, you know. And uh, he will not share his glory with those behind us. Please do not be behind. You know, um, the glory of God is not for those in the Old Testament who want old covenant. You know, and if you want to, you could jump up and down and let, let that cork pop and let... <laughs> There's Roland jumping up and down. I let the new wine come up, brother. I'll come and celebrate with you in Newfoundland. You know, get rid of McDonald's theology. Here of us, there of us, there and there of us. And we've got to get rid of that. I love that. And I love the way he put it. And we have been living like that, preaching like that. Notice, this is a big one, the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis is what we see in the scripture. I see Jesus is what we read into the scripture. We've had a lot of that. We've had a lot of that in the body of Jesus Christ. Now, this has been, uh, this has probably stretched some of you. It means that you have to go back and study it. Some people, somebody told me that this is fantastic. They've never heard it like this before. Indeed, indeed. It requires study. It just goes to show you that the scripture is not something to be trifled upon. Now, Dustin Noseworthy, I see you chimed in. So I am going to call on you to. To, to just chat with us a bit, Dustin. Give us your thoughts. Here you are. Yeah, no, no great stuff. But, you know, um, you know, my thing is always the most important thing when we understand the New Testament is to understand the events of AD 70. And which I'm sure is probably the most controversial thing that's been talked about tonight. And so I'll just keep going with controversial for a moment. But understanding that the last days are not in our future, they're in our past, you know. I taught on this a few years ago, and someone asked me, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? I said, I'm no trib. <laughs> I said, I'm no trib, because the trib, the tribulation, was a tribulation for the Jewish people. Now, that, that doesn't mean there's no tribulation in the world today. I mean, COVID was a type of tribulation. But Jesus said, when he spoke to that generation, which was the 40-year period from his resurrection to eighty seventy that the tribulation would come upon them would be something that the world had never seen before and it would never be again. And so though we have trials and tribulations, what happened in the first century was worse than anything that could happen and will never happen again. And so to understand the New Testament, that is a truth we desperately need to understand because if you don't understand this, then there's a number of things that Paul wrote that makes no sense. Like number one, um, well, P the apostle Peter said, judgment starts in the house of God. And so we have to ask ourselves, is God pouring out judgment on the church today? Or maybe since Peter was talking to a Jewish audience, he was specifically talking to people who understood that a physical temple in the middle of Jerusalem was the house of God. And that when the Romans would invade Jerusalem, that that would be God's judgment. 
and that would be the start of judgment and it would be something that would be for that audience and not for us and so um I think that's very important. So, I mean, and even, I know I'm going off on the eschatological stuff, but even with the book of Revelation, I mean, if you understand its roots being already fulfilled at AD 70, then as Bishop said, you know, you understand the interpretation, but then you can understand the application. So now today, when we read the book of Revelation, instead of trying to make it be literal to our generation, you can take the truths that God spoke to that generation and apply it to ours. Not necessarily about the world ending, but things like the relationship between religion and politics, uh, things that happen when the church moves away from the message of the finished work. And you can interpret the revelation and apply it to your life without going into a doom and gloom theology. And so that's what most stood out to me tonight. Yeah. Powerful, powerful. So, so according to the book of Revelation, we don't have bugs, big, big like Volkswagen coming out of the pit. And uh, we, don't have, uh, we don't have a beast. I should not go down to the beach in Mayaro waiting for a, a, a beast with seven heads and ten horns to arrive and then call him the Antichrist. So, so the, the book is it's figurative. I think the book begins by telling you that uh, these things are signified and signified. So it, the book declares at the very beginning that it is a figurative book. So that when we read, you know, we read Revelation 5 and we see a lamb in the throne, nobody thinks that's uh, an agricultural creature. We all know that's the person of Jesus. So we got figurative there. So if our hermeneutic is consistent, then the book is figurative. Uh, you know, but it's interesting, especially for us here in Trinidad. Matthew 24, ladies and gentlemen, let me submit to you. I know many of you, I've heard it again and again that Matthew 24 is not yet fulfilled and that is speaking of the rapture and the last days and what will happen, etc. There shall be wars and rumors of wars, etc. I want to submit to you, Matthew 24 was fulfilled in AD 70. That was a Jesus, uh, that's a time, date, stamp, scripture. Jesus was talking to that generation. Uh, when Jesus was talking, he said, he did not say, okay, I'm saying these things now, but it's actually for Kelvin Muhammad and his people in the 21st century. No, no. He was talking to that generation. Now, people, are, I've heard people do things like double referencing, etc. Now, if you, if you wish to do that, that, that really is, is your choice. But I have to tell you, uh, my friends, that, that those things came to pass, came to pass. But somebody says, you know, well, if all those things came to pass, what do we have to look forward to? And, and that's, that's the question. Uh, and, and Bishop, I'm going to pull you into this. Uh, what do we have to look forward to? I, I know you're, I'm probably preempting where you're going. No, 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 that, that's all right. Well, we, we have looked forward to uh, he's making all things new. Uh, right. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the beauty of the kingdom of God is like, uh, like seed. Uh, you know, like yeah. leaven, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I mean, the truth is, the world today is better than it's ever been in the history of mankind. I have, I have, I have a friend. Uh, his name's J.D. King. They wrote a book called "Why We've Been Duped into Believing the World Is Getting Worse," and he mainly uses secular statistics to actually show the world today is better than it's ever been in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have less war, we have less poverty, uh, we have less starvation. Uh, people are living longer than they've ever lived. Uh, I mean, the, the truth is, you know, but again, it's mainly Western people who think the world is falling apart, and especially Americans when COVID took place and all of a sudden they can't go to their favorite restaurant and they got laid off for a couple of months. And all of a sudden it's the tribulation, even though then they got an extra $600 a week. Uh, you know, from the government, and then they got stimulus on top of it. But it, it's only Americans that will say the world is getting worse while they're driving down the road in their Lexus, pull up to their house with an attached two-car garage, go in the house and watch a 60-inch flat screen. I mean, people in the middle class, lower middle class today in the 21st century live better than kings of three and 400 years ago. Better than kings. Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing day we live in. I, I, I wanted to also just mention, uh, for those of you that haven't uh, got a copy of my book yet, uh, listen, I'm telling you, a lot of this stuff I deal with when it comes to the myths and things that have been mistranslated, 
uh, a, a lot of the things that we've questioned for a lot of years, uh, some of the stuff that I talked about even today, encourage you to go check the book out. I also uh, am going to be having in the next few weeks a, a six-hour e-course on eschatology uh, that's coming out. You can check all that out on my website. Uh, you know, Please do that also. I believe it'll be a, a blessing to you. Yeah, I would really encourage folks to follow uh, Jamie Inglehart on Facebook, you know, and um, send him a friend request. Tell him you're a friend of mine, and I'm sure he will accept you. Uh, but but really, really, uh, you know, you, we need to be informed. A lot happened here tonight, too much to comment on, too much to say. Uh, we would have to go back and study. I would encourage us to be stu uh, studious. So the, the, the whole mindset of I will stay at home, read my Bible, and God's going to talk to me uh, does not give correct interpretation. We need to bring our minds into the community. And even as you quoted the Eastern Church, where there was a kind of a community understanding of the scripture. Ladies and gentlemen, the, 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 the truth of the Bible is, is important for our lives and is not something to be trifled upon. You know, and uh, let, let me say, we've gotten a lot of our information from the media, the media, and the media will make us believe the world is ending. It'll make you believe that uh, things are really, really bad. But as Bishop said, some of us are living better than kings lived a couple of hundred years ago. And, uh, and the world is not going to hell in a handbasket. No, it's not. We are, we are kingdom people. We are manifesting the kingdom of God. We are manifesting. We are literally the gates of heaven in the earth. We need an optimistic gospel. Amen. We need to be salt and light in the midst of the earth. We are the expression of the kingdom of God in the earth. We bring healing. We bring deliverance. We bring salvation. We bring life to people. When we walk, light and life comes in the earth. We are the salt of the earth, ladies and gentlemen. We are not little desperate humans running, uh, you know, from Antichrist, waiting for the rapture. Oh my, oh my, when will Jesus come? He has come in you. You know, somebody said, God showed up in you. There's no one else coming. God showed up in you. There's no one else coming. I want you to change your posture. And I want you to, to have an, a posture of, of understanding that you are the manifestation of God's life in the earth. Uh, Ansel, I, I know you're on the call. Um, I'm not sure if you're hearing us, Ansel. I'd like you just to chime in a, a little bit. Ansel is um, w one of the men that I, I, I really respect for his views on, on the understanding of the kingdom of God. We're always talking. Ansel, uh, tell us your, your take tonight. Well, I love it. Yeah. I really, really love um, what was said. Um, it took me almost 43 years to arrive at some of these um, principles and understanding of how we approach the scriptures. And um, I just want to feed, I mean, a whole lot more off of Janie. Um, you know, sometimes it's good when you are stretched and uh, when you are challenged. And uh, it's great um, to hear um, things that you yourself um, was afraid um, to say. And um, if you would have said those things, um, you were labeled as a um, heretic. And um, you know, you would have been driven out of churches. And um, sometimes when you experience these things like myself, uh, you become mute on, until you hear the voice of God um, speaking these things in somebody else. And I want to thank God for, you know, persons like Jamie and Bert White and um, Dustin. Um, you know, they are real, real pillars of encouragement um, for me. You know, I would just not say any more than that tonight. Amen. Amen. Excellent. Thank you, Ansel. Uh, there are people who've been hearing God for quite a while, and now God is bringing confirmation. I would ask you to be like one of the noble Burians, search the scriptures, read, read, understand. What, what we are saying is launching us into a new level of understanding. It's going to change the way you relate to God. 
It's going to change the way you relate to people. It will change the way you do business and the way you do business at home and the way, you do, the way we do business in church is going to change. And this has been extraordinary. I want to thank all of you who chimed in. There are people on Facebook who are live and alive right now and part of the conversation on Facebook. So I want to say again, hello to the people on Facebook. We will upload this to the Mentoring for the 21st Century page. It will be on my Facebook page and eventually get this on YouTube. So we want to thank the Lord. So let us lift our hands. I encourage you, you even to unmute your mic. Amen. In the name of Jesus, come on. The Bible tells us that God spins around and he gets very emotional and he does a happy dance. Some of us need to change. So just shake the cork, shake the bottle <laughs> Of the new covenant wine, let that cork pop and let the glory of the Lord come out. So, Father, we bless you. We thank you. Yes, we give you praise tonight. We shake that bottle of the new covenant. We shake that new wine. As you put it up, let that cork be out. And out come the papa. Out come the filth, the power, the grace of the new covenant in the name of Jesus. We give you praise that divine healing come out. That divine healing come out. That divine <laughs> the life of God to you. We release the blessing of God to you. We release the favor of God to you. We thank you, God, for your word tonight. We thank you for this revelation of Jesus Christ. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We bless you. We praise you. We honor you. We magnify your name. And we give you praise. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy and for your love. Oh, lift your hands. In the name of Jesus, your hands. Declare with me. Say, I'm blessed and not cursed. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I will live and not die. I will live and not die. And I will see the glory of God. And I will do the will of God. In the name of Jesus. Oh, oh, clap your hands unto the Lord. Come on, shake that button. Shake that button. Shake the button of the new covenant. Let the cock pop. Let the cock pop. Let the glory of the Lord be released. Hallelujah. Be released. And release it in your home. Release it in your family. Release it in your children's life. Release it in your daily life. Let the cock pop. And let the glory of the Lord be seen in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth in Jesus' name. We want to thank all of you who have chimed in. We want to thank all of you who have been um, who have faithfully chimed in week after week. Amen. And we thank God for all of you who have uh, who have been consistent. I want to encourage you as you continue to study this word. Greater things are 